a lot of education and outreach. We do a lot of cooperative research with federal and university people. Everything I'm presenting to you today was developed through research, otherwise this would be a very, very short talk. I can't emphasize the importance of research and methods development because all the tools and things I'm going to tell you about, including the biology of this pest, when emerald ash borer was first discovered in Michigan in 2002, the scientific literature was one paragraph in Chinese. That's it. I'm not kidding. That was it. That was the entire. They had to go over to some guy in Slovakia or someplace to get the thing um, um, uh, positively identified. And then I'm a, um, we also give lots of management recommendations to communities, private landowners, um, other state agencies, um, et cetera. So lots of invasive species. This is the short list. Everything with a star, asterisk, is already in the state. Um, other things uh, we're uh, concerned about. Winter moths in uh, New England makes gypsy moth look like a wimp. Uh, we don't want that one, um, and we have some, a lot of other ones. But I'm going to focus in on emerald ash borer today. And just in general, through trade, uh, lots of stuff comes over on solid wood packing material. Um, ever since Thomas Jefferson decided to start bringing different things over across the Atlantic, uh, we've been bringing stuff over from Europe and through trade. And all, all you got to do is you know, just go into the store and read the label where things come from. Okay, we have lots of trade and pests, diseases, insects, etc. Love to hitch rides on all of that stuff. So sometimes, and this is sudden oak death, uh, Phytophthora mormont, California. This is a Cyrex nutkilio, our beast, our friend here. Anybody know what that is? All right, that's our state tree. Asian longhorn beetle. We don't want that one. Gypsy moth. And some people accuse me of being a pest. <laughs> and sometimes my staff gets really frustrated and likes to take matters into their own hands. Believe it or not, that's an improved way to sample branches way up high in the tree. So you have a community. You got trees. You got wetlands. You got a forest, etc. And if you've got a lot of ash, it's going to start looking like this. The emerald ash borer is probably, in my career, the closest thing that comes to chestnut blight as a disease. Diseases always scare me. I'm a forest entomologist by training. Diseases always scare me because pathologists can never agree on what to call stuff. They keep changing the names all the time. Entomologists are a little bit slower to do that. They like to pick on the pathologist. But emerald ash borer is attacking a whole um, genus in North America. And dealing with communities, a lot of communities in Pennsylvania, I think we have more levels of government than any other state in the union. When you add it up, it's 2,629. Um, if I gave a talk every single day for um, every work day, it would take me 10 years to go talk to every single community uh, in Pennsylvania. I sometimes feel like I've already done that. Um, so we've had a lot of outreach. Things like this, we've dealt with the um, um, State Association of Townships and things like that. But this is really targeted towards communities. Everybody lives in a community. Okay? You all have water resources, you all have land, you have all open space, et cetera. So this, this talk's targeted to folks like that. So potential impact, if you've got ash, this is going to happen. It is going to happen. Your trees are going to get attacked. They will die. 99% uh, mortality, and uh, the problem with um, impacts on or, or, or attacking ash is that ash tree dies within three to five years after being infested, and the problem with ash trees are in that first year they become very brittle. They are very dangerous to take down. In some of the Midwestern states, the incident of arborists taking down trees, their injury rates have gone up. You, know, you get a really big ash tree and it's already dead due to emerald ash borer, um, they might not want to bid on your job to take that tree down because it's too dangerous. So being proactive and dealing with this ahead of time, if you don't have a high infestation or you don't have it yet, the, the, the idea behind this talk today is to take a look at your ash resource and decide what you're going to do about it. Um, like I said, we've been dealing with um, uh, getting the word out to townships uh, through their state organization. We've given uh, several talks to their, they have a big uh, conference every year in, in Hershey, like 
thousands of people come to that thing. It's, it's amazing how many people are at that. We've spoke, spoken at that. We've done webinars, things like that. Um, actually, I am giving a webinar next Thursday, um, EAB University. Um, we actually give lots of talks on that, so I have a, a talk I'm giving then uh, uh, next, next Thursday. We've been dealing with a lot of communities, some of them on, pi on a pilot base. I'm going to go into these a, a, a little bit more, but these are some of the communities we've been working with. I uh, want to bring you up to date on the emerald ash borer. It's from China. The larvae feed just below the surface. This is from Three Mile Island. <laughs> um, feed just below the surface of the tree. The S-shaped gap, it's in the living tissue. So many beetles, larvae attack the tree, it girdles the tree and kills the tree. Okay, that's what kills the tree. That's the larvae. The actual size guys are done, are in here. You can come up and take a look at, at, at it later. These are the S-shaped galleries. Um, the D-shaped exit hole, when it chews its way out, it's flat on top, round on the bottom. It comes out like that. That's why it's D-shaped. It's diagnostic for emerald ash borer on ash. You got to watch it. There is a native <laughs> ash borer that comes out and makes more of an oval one and only attacks really, really stressed and dying trees called the red-headed ash borer. But sometimes on big, thick bark ash trees, it comes out on an angle. Sometimes it looks D-shaped. You ever see a D-shaped exit hole? Um, you can cut out the window, uh, you can actually peel back some of the bark. But you see these S-shaped galleries. The S-shaped gallery is diagnostic for emerald ash borer. Life, it's got a complete life cycle. Um, the uh, one thing about low infestation populations, sometimes when they come out um, into July, uh, so they hatch really late. Sometimes the larvae uh, will go through a, a two-year cycle in the, tr in, in the tree. It makes it kind of hard to um, detect that way, but when populations build up, um, it's basically a full, complete generation in, in, in one Where year. Where are the eggs laid? They are laid on the surface of the bark in nooks and crannies. The egg hatches and the larvae burrows into the tree, starts feeding. It's as an S-shaped gallery and it starts out really small. And as it gets bigger, it goes bigger and bigger and bigger, that S-shaped thing, till it then does this pupation thing. Actually, it kind of folds itself over in like a C-shaped thing. And then it will come out in the spring pretty close to the D-shape. Bigger and bigger, bigger, bigger. And then it pupates, etc. And then it eats its way out. The winter part of the life cycle. Uh, Things from China, it gets cold in China. I'll show, so they're show under that the bark. The they're under the bark. Yep. Yep. Uh, that serpentine gallery is diagnostic. That D-shaped exit hole is diagnostic. You'll often see um, on thinner bark trees some bark splits, and that's because of the feeding underneath it. Bark splits happen due to other things like frost cracks and things like that. But uh, if you peel that back, you can see it. You, you start seeing dieback eventually get mortality. Um, epicormic branching can happen due to any kind of stress. When we first discovered this out in Michigan, we started looking for it in PA, and a lot of ash in our forest are in decline. Uh, once ash gets going in, into decline, especially with all the drought we had, it, believe it or not, we used to have a lot of drought, especially in the 90s, um, ash doesn't recover from that very well. So we had a lot of decline. So unfortunately, the Admiral ash borer likes to pick on the stressed trees first. So, um, and again, this is just showing you all the, this is the reason why, this is a 30 inch diameter tree. That's a lot of beetles. Yeah? Is there uh, a native <coughs> control in China that could be imported? I'll, I'll get to that. Yep, we're doing that. Yep, we're doing three parasitoids. Um, over here, there is one native generalist parasitoid that they discovered in Michigan. The other thing is, the best time to find Emerald ash borer is woodpeckers absolutely love them. You'll see the flecking off the bark. They actually detect it quicker than we do. Um, when you see that flecking, it's already too late. Um, 
you're just pulling these things out. Of, you can see that S-shaped gallery here. This is a tree in northwestern Ohio. This has got three years of infestation before we peeled that bark off that tree. That tree looked perfectly good. The next year, it would have started showing signs of decline. Um, it builds up very rapidly. And like I said, once it gets into the tree and builds up within three to five years, your tree is dead. Back in 2009, they did a nice study trying to predict the spread. Keep an eye on this 2013-2015 map. Good. Wait till I show you the next map. Um, they estimated that, uh, okay, by 2019, it'll be in 25 states, so 38 million trees will be dead. Uh, a lot of tree removals and replacement, uh, you know, $10.7 billion. Let me just say that was a conservative estimate, and he undershot just about everything, because yes, it indeed, today it's in 25 states. It was just discovered across the border uh, in Louisiana from the Arkansas infestation. It's also in two Canadian provinces, Ontario and Quebec. Is this a GIS data available online? Not online, but the maps you can pull off um, Emerald Ash Borer um, info. I'm talking about the actual data. Also. Both the f f U.S. for we turn our data. There's um, departments of ag collect data in the regulatory areas. Um, they're not regu uh, regulating it now in Pennsylvania because it's the whole states. So they don't do surveys. We do surveys, but all of our stuff is geo-referenced. Um, the national database from the USDA, Department of Ag, and the U.S. Forest Service has databases. It does come through North China, actually also Russia and Mongolia. It gets cold there, okay? So these cold overwintering temperatures might kill a few of them in thin bark trees, but trust me, there's plenty of emerald ash borer out there. Somebody else had a question? Your last slide. The red dots on the map, is that the counties where you located? These are the first detections in each county. Okay, there's, there's a lot more, okay, um, uh, th where it's been detected, but those were the initial detections. Each red dot is the initial detection in that county um, for, for, for a particular year. All counties in Pennsylvania have the ash borer now? Not yet. I'll show you a map. All right. So it comes from China. Worldwide, depending on uh, the taxonomist you talk to, 43 different recognized species. Um, oh, by the way, um, mountain ash is not an ash, okay? That's just a common name, so this is not attacked by uh, the emerald ash borer, okay? Only in the genus Fraxinus. What's at risk? Um, again, splitters and lumpers, and some have more, some have less. The really dark green areas are where there's a lot of ash, also the yellow. Um, so you can see that this is going to be a um, you know, countrywide um, uh, problem. Also, just FYI, in a lot of the western states, just like in the east, ash is planted as an urban tree. Okay, so it's all over the west. <coughs> Uh, one thing that we, um, uh, this is uh, produced uh, uh, by the Forest Service, and, um, and they look at a number of different factors, and they do this for a number of different paths of risk of establishment, introduction and establishment, and they did this without looking at the EAB detection data, and it was first discovered in Detroit and Ontario, okay, and that's highly lit up. Um, so, we... These kinds of things are good because it helps us focus in on where we should be looking for it, which is what we did. Um, that area right there, that's where it was first discovered in Pennsylvania. So we did kind of our own risk map where we looked at, um, this thing's moved around a lot by firewood. Uh, ash forest products, we looked at where the ash was. Early on, this kind of helped us de uh, uh, determine uh, where we would go look for it. And this is the current distribution map. Um, the year progression, do not think of that as spread. That's a function of us looking for it and finding it. Uh, this is the new state, I mean, new county uh, this, this year for 2015. Ooh, I did that. Um, just because Lancaster, Chester, Delaware, and these aren't lit up, trust me, they're there. It's over here in New Jersey. Right there, we just discovered. Um, it's just a matter of time um, before we actually officially find it. Um, I just tell people, 
it's everywhere. And close by here, these were the initial detections in, um, actually first it was in Bucks County, pretty close to the line. Uh, we actually were putting a trap up in this park for another invasive species, um, a, a walnut twig beetle that carries the thousand canker disease of black walnut. And uh, he also stuck up a purple panel trap there and lo and behold, we caught the emerald ash borer there. Um, so those are the- uh, That's what those traps are, the purple traps? Yeah, yeah. We don't put those up too much anymore because it's statewide. We put them up a little bit along the northern tier because that's where our ash forests are and we're looking for sites to um, uh, establish biocontrol release sites. So we want to know as it gets to there. You can't release the parasitoids unless you have emerald ash borer. The problem with serving for emerald ash borer is there's no good early detection tool and that's why this thing is spread so quickly. The purple panel traps are basically put up and the beetle's flying around someplace and runs into the thing. It's got a lure and it's attracted to um, either green or purple. How did it get here? A lot of invasive species come over in, in uh, uh, cargo containers. Um, they only inspect about 2% of these things coming into the country. So a lot of stuff gets in. There are now rules on, the, on uh, international standards for treating solid wood packing material. Um, if everybody would follow the standards and follow those rules, it'd be great, but lots of countries like to put the stamp on it and they don't do anything about it, and um, so they kind of cheat. So stuff still gets through. Um, local wood products, um, the movement of local wood products, the movement of firewood helps spread these things around. Um, domestic pathways, either moving logs from nursery stock, that's how it got to Virginia. Um, guy um, bought some. I thought he was buying it from a nursery in Tennessee, but it was transshipped from Michigan inside the quarantine area. What I love it about that, they caught the guy, he knowingly did it. The judge fined him and then he put him to work helping cut down all the ash trees that were dying in the southeastern Michigan area. I love that guy. I love that judge. That was great. Um, one thing about the, um, the ash lumber doesn't get degraded. This thing does not go down into the wood. It's on the surface. So you can actually um, that's one thing too, with ash utilization, we get some nice trees, the borough uh, uh, of Lewisburg has done this um, with our assistance. Uh, you can take down the trees, you can actually mill and get the lumber, and then this is the bad stuff. And all I can say is firewood is huge in the movement and dispersal of this thing. Lots of campaigns about don't move firewood, um, don't move firewood. Pennsylvania was one of the first states, we have an external quarantine. You cannot bring firewood into Pennsylvania without a permit. So tell all your camping buddies, etc. Uh, county to county? County to county, it's perfectly legal. We tell people, try not to move firewood anymore in about 50 miles, but there's no rule on that. Within Pennsylvania, you can move it anywhere you want. You just can't bring it in from out of state. Did I say don't move firewood? <coughs> just want to make sure I got that point across. Um, there is this brochure up here. Um, we do have a um, bad bug um, <coughs> uh, hotline or email. Um, that's actually how we found it in Central PA. Master Gardener went to an EAB talk, came back, posted a blog. A neighbor said, hey, that's, what's wrong with my tree? Took a picture, sent it in. That's how we found it in Mifflin County. Pennsylvania, what's at risk? Uh, we have three principal species maybe up to five. This 308 million trees, that's the forest. About 4%, so actually a little bit more of this forest cover. This does not count urban trees. You could probably double this number if you added up all the er uh, uh, ash trees that were planted in an urban situation. Black ash is uh, uh, a species, you don't have a lot of it, but it's in very, very, very wet sites. Okay, um, then along stream corridors and things you get the green ash, we have a lot, and then a little bit more upland we have white ash. Blue ash is rare, we have not yet found it. There's some historical records, we can't find it um, in the woods, it's mainly a southern species. There is a blue ash um, planted in uh, the borough of Westchester, and it was the first tree that we treated in one of their parks. It was planted in the 1850s, so it's pretty, pretty cool. We do have pumpkin ash, and it's mainly up near in Erie, Erie Bluffs. 
and that's a rare species, and we are documenting where those things are and, and, and treating them and, and protecting them. Now, impact. I'll use Philadelphia because they're one of the um, places that uh, designed a, uh, a uh, uh, emerald ash borer plan. They've got a goal of increasing their canopy cover by 30%. Uh, 6% of their trees, canopy cover in Philly is 6% is is ash. They're going to die. So their goal of increasing by 30% just went up to 36%. So here's the kind of the impact, especially in their parks, they got a lot. They got a pretty good plan put together in Fairmount. Anybody been to Fairmount Park? Lots of ash trees. Uh, so they're focusing in on some of those, uh, those areas, especially the, the park areas. But that's, that's already impacting a, a, a program where they want to increase their tree canopy, but 6% of it's already ash, and that's going to die. Ohio did a pretty good study. Uh, they got a lot more ash than we do. Um, the impact on property owners, they're going to estimate at about a billion dollars. And for uh, management of, of, of Ohio's forest industry, another $2 billion. Um, that's probably a conservative estimate. So that's just one state, $3 billion. Native Americans especially the black ash up in the lake states and some of the northern states. Mm -hmm. Black ash is integral to their culture, especially basket weaving. Um, this is a, they're working, uh, <coughs> feds in the states are working a lot with some of the tribes. And unfortunately, black ash is probably the most uh, susceptible of the North American species to it. It really takes a hit. Um, so this, this is one of those impacts that you know you don't think about you know we think about you know trees and water and air and stuff like that this is integral to their culture and so that's a problem and then yeah, like baseball do. <laughs> where do they make baseball bats out of ash, ash and maple. maple asian longhorn beetle attacks maple so you're going to start hearing pings pretty soon um yeah um Northern tier of Pennsylvania and up into New York, Louisville Slugger gets a lot of their ash. Slow growing ash trees, nice tight rings, long period of time, good, makes good baseball bats. Tree values in, 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 in uh, uh, urban settings. Uh, this is Altoona. You drive into Altoona, every single one of these trees going down that boulevard is an ash tree. Um, we had, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, program that we've got, uh, sitting of a pilot program. Uh, they listened to what we said, but their concern was just those 94 trees coming into town. And the reason for that is because all 94 of those trees is a memorial tree. Okay, dedicated. So that's their value in their community was just that, 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 that street coming in where you had 94 trees. Impacts to your urban street trees. This is Toledo Street, 2006. That's 2009, okay? They were already here. I didn't realize you just tap the screen. They were already here in these trees. Within three to five years, they were all dead. And those are some nice hazard trees now. So this is coming to a neighbor here near you. Forest. That creates a lot of gap. That's a lot of dead trees that happen all at once. I mean, hey, trees die, okay? Trees get old, they die. But not a whole genus in an area all at once. There's a, uh, one of our district foresters in the central part of the state a few years ago said, or one year he said, I don't think we're gonna have, we must not have, I don't think we have much ash, and that could be much of a problem. Next, next year, is it, oh, wow, that's, that's a lot. The third year, oh my God, look at all the dead ash. That's how quick it'll happen. So when you do something like this, that impacts what happens down in the forest and in, in, in your water resources. It creates gaps, you know, this, and you do stuff like that, if, uh, if you're having a hard time uh, regenerating anything up, <coughs> what happens when you get disturbance in a forest? Invasive plant species come in. So you've got that problem. Um, so you, you're creating these gaps. And what does that mean ecologically? 
lot invasives, that's the big thing, but it also changes a lot of other things. I'm not going to go through this, but it does change your whole resource cycling, nutrients, water, um, your biodiversity, interaction, ecological interactions. It changes all, everything else in that forest. All your arthropods, all the competition, herbivory, etc. The good news is there's lots of folks looking at this kind of stuff and, do and documenting and, and doing that kind of research. And when you get these coarse woody debris all at one time, that creates problems. And it also creates spot for invasive plants. Ash. This is just looking at arthropods. There are 44 species that rely almost solely on ash. So they're threatened. These guys, you know, uh, low risk species, I mean, they feed on probably a lot of other things, visit that tree, a lot of other trees, probably not that, not that big of a deal. But you're basically looking at probably uh, 50, 60 some species that, um, that arthropod, just arthropods use. So, and remember, this is a, a genus that's getting attacked. So, here's the other issue that you have. I mean, we're here looking at watersheds and water values, et cetera, but they become hazard trees real quick. We do have a documented death in Pennsylvania, in a park, during a storm, young girl underneath an ash tree, infested with emerald ash borer, branch came down, killed her. So those of you who have legal responsibility, you own property and you own an ash, and if you know that that's a hazard tree, you didn't know it was a hazard tree, something happens, okay, the judge's going to let you off. But if you do know and you didn't do anything about it, we try to tell this to municipalities, especially right-of-ways, okay, uh, looking at right-of-ways, parks, trees uh, in, in the, you know, the, uh, you know, out in front of the courthouse, along walkways, etc. Those trees become very brittle very quickly. Not only branch snap, but you get bowl snap, okay. The, 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 the trunk of the tree snaps, not just the branches snapping, the whole, you get a, we've had lots of storms, those trees are going to be much more prone to breaking and coming down. So after three to five years of tree standing, it has no uh, lumber value at all? You better take that out before it dies or the year it does die because it comes very brittle very quickly. So to, if you had a forest where you had um, um, marketable uh, timber, um, then yeah. And I don't say go out and cut all your ash. I'm going to get to that a little bit uh, about our state forest. Um, any case, a lot to do with um, not, not just emerald ash borer, but really should be cognizant of what constitutes a hazard tree and, and, and deal with that. And. Like I said, street trees, you've got, here's a stop sign. Those are two ash trees. Look where that branch is, right over the stop sign. Parks, by the way, this is that woodpecker flecking on, on, on the bowl of the tree that you can see there. Um, this is actually out in Allegheny County Parks, their North Park. Back in 2010, we actually implemented a demonstration site to put together all the um, tools and we worked with them. It was great because it was not only that, it was a watershed area, um, kind of on the side of where the outbreak was, and uh, we protected trees there. It was great because they had a nature center there. It was a great education thing. But again, here, here's a walking trail, and these are ash trees. So you've got a, you've got a hazard situation there. Um, schools, this is actually in um, uh, the township out in... Um, uh, uh, county, uh, north of North Allegheny. Uh, starts with a B. Uh, Thank you. Um, <coughs> this was actually the, close to the location where it was originally found. This is a school. This is a baseball field. This is the home run line. Those are ash trees. Um, those are those are dead ash trees. Um, this is a park in, in, in the borough of Westchester. Here's a, this, that, that's a, um, I think that was a 60 inch diameter ash tree right next, right next to the playground. There's several of them. Yeah. 
So, um, so here's a hanging. So branches start falling apart, you know. Um, took this in the park a little while later, slightly over to the side. Okay, got a school group out there. And every, almost all these trees are ash. Okay, that happens to be in the borough of Westchester. So, what are your options? Well, you can remove the trees. First, you probably want to do an assessment of where your ash trees are and look at the health of those ash trees. And I'll show you a little flow chart. A lot of everything I'm talking about today is available on our web page. Okay, documents, uh, templates, resources, etc., are all on our web page. But obviously tree removal is one. They tried to do this initially to eradicate it because that's how we did it with an Asian longhorn beetle. Asian longhorn beetle moves more slowly. Emerald ash borer is a much better flyer, um, kills the trees quicker, moves around quicker, and that didn't work. But you can still remove trees because every tree that is removed, that's where it breeds. So you're reducing the breeding um, area for, for future uh, emerald ash borer. Insecticides. There are lots of different things that work. Um, Imidacloprid, um, Safari, some of the pyrethes spraying in the trees, etc. But that's an annual treatment. That's an annual treatment. That's an annual treatment. Emamectin benzoate. <coughs> Gotta stop touching the screen. It, it's uh, kind of a play on words called triage. There's now another company, the same insecticide. It's called something different. I uh, can't remember that name. They just came out. That can't be bought by you. It has to be bought by a certified registered pesticide applicator because it's injected into the tree. So there's no spraying. There's no putting it in, this, in the soil. It's directed into the sapwood of the tree. The good news about that is you get anywhere. The label says two years of control. We have some recommended rates, uh, a little bit on the higher side, especially larger trees. Um, some of the research is showing you can get up to five years of control. So it, it actually, it's a kind of a unique chemistry. You inject it into the sapwood, and as the tree grows, the insecticide goes out with the new sapwood. So it's more of a preventative thing. If your tree is already attacked, you're not going to repair the damage. Emerald ash borer has already made all those galleries, and it's a systemic insecticide. Okay, how's the insecticide going to get up to the top of the tree if there's no more vascular system? So you want to treat trees before they're attacked. Our rule of thumb is when you go look at a tree, whether em emerald ash borer is there or not, you kind of look at the health of the tree. And if more than 30% of that crown looks dead or dying, don't bother. It's got to be a healthy tree. Any thoughts on uh, once you begin uh, treatment and say a whole bunch of ashes go down around you, how many years do you have to continue that treatment to protect it, the tree? Good, good question. I'm actually going to talk about that. Um, they're doing that kind of work in Michigan right now. They're looking at the aftermath. And the hope is, is that emerald ash borer needs ash. So if most of the ash is dead, it's harder to find the ash. So if you've got a protected tree there, you have to protect it long enough so the uh, emerald ash borer population goes down. So you're probably about 10 years. One thing about emerald ash borer, I mean, ash trees, it's stump sprouts. And emerald ash borer can attack a stump sprout that's no more than about an inch in diameter. So it can maintain its population. Great information on uh, emerald ash borer info. That's a national website. All the states that have emerald ash borer participate, all the a lot of information, information on insecticides, et cetera, are all, all, all listed there. Um, this document uh, has already been updated. And it does work. We treated these this tree in 2011. Those trees were green in 2011, partially green. They're now dead. This is in Allegheny County on North Park, and this tree stole on. Um, close to 99% protection with that. Imidacloprid, some of the other ones, at low populations, imidacloprid will work when the, when a huge population hits the area. Imidacloprid works differently. It goes out to the leaves. Where is the critter feeding? It's feeding in the sapwood. That's the target. It's in the sapwood. So it's more efficient. Um, about you'll get about 60% control 
with imidacloprid and some of the other ones um, when the, the huge wave. Early on, if you don't have any area, it might be a good thing. It's a cheaper option. MMEC and benzoate's more expensive, but remember, you only have to treat like once every three to four years. Biological control. Um, there's a nice big lab the USDA built in Brighton, Michigan. Um, there's three species being released, an egg, um, and these two attack the, the larval stage. Uh, we started releasing in 2011. We've already got recovery in 2012. Um, they're very, very, very tiny. Uh, there's a fourth one in the same genus here. Um, this one's not as cold hardy. And the female, um, it oviposits by sticking its ovipositor through the bark and nailing the larvae. Um, but she's got a really short ovipositor. There's another species that's got a longer one, so we, and it's a little bit more cold hardy. So that's still in quarantine. Um, but we are releasing these around the last year. This is how many we released at three sites. We're, um, we've done some augmentative releases. We've gone back in some of the previous sites, and we're finding new sites along the northern tier in Pennsylvania. Where are those species from? Uh, they all came from China. Okay. Yep. And they only attack agrilis. Um, this species specifically, they will, anybody know about the bronze birch borer? Same genus, okay. It will attack um, bronze birch borer, but won't complete its life cycle on that. Ash utilization. This is a nice tree from uh, from the streets of Detroit. Um, I grew up in Detroit. All our trees were elm. You know what happened to those? Back in the 60s, guess what they replanted? Ash. So all those ash have been growing since the 60s. So another rule of thumb, diversify, diversify, diversify. Don't plant, like Altoona did, 94 ash trees down the boulevard. Um, again, ash utilization, this, this, this wood is, is perfectly fine to use. And actually some communities are doing that. Um, City of Monroe, Michigan, did that, have a, a, a deal where some of the wood that would come in, they would use and have it sawed up, use it for picnic tables and, and outbuildings and stuff like that. And then also the, the company that was taking it down would also use some of the other species that they were taking down. Here's the big problem, recovery. In a watershed area, that's going to be difficult in the forest. We're basically letting the forest go. There's nothing you can do. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in our Pennsylvania State Forest. But basically, uh, community, yeah, you can replant. Just don't replant with ash. Um, and depending on where you're at, um, um, all states have um, some, uh, either through their extension agency or their rural community forestry, in their DNRs um, have a list of things to, to, to replant. But the whole restoration thing, there's a lot of work going on into that, into the natural environment of <coughs> what we're going to do with these, uh, especially in the areas. Pennsylvania, we're kind of, there's only a few areas where we got upwards of 20% ash in the northern tier. Um, it still is 4% of our, of our total uh, forest, so that still has an impact. Um, so what did we do? Starting with the feds, we have a framework and they're still working on a strategy um, that we're working with them, but we took a lot of their information. We took information from other states and cities like Milwaukee and Chicago and places in Michigan, mm -hmm. etc. And we came up with our own, uh, looked at that, and early on, uh, a couple of years after we discovered it in Pennsylvania in 2007, um, by the way, we discovered it in 2007, but it had been here since 2000. Before they actually detected and figured out what it was in Michigan, it was already here. How do we do it? Because you can go through the tree and do tree ring analysis. And you can find, uh, actually the infestation in Michigan discovered in 2002 is probably there since the late 1980s. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, we pulled together some ideas for um, uh, state park plans. The borough of Westchester was our first model plan and is being implemented. It's all of these plans that I'm talking about today are available online. Um, this was nice because one, yes, I live near Borough of Westchester. I do the Arbor Day presentation in Hoops Park and almost all of those trees are ash. 
So I always give my little presentation. And the city manager came to talk to us. And at Westchester University is Dr. Jarrah oh, Hertel. He used to work in the Forest Service, retired. He used to head up the forest health programs for the Forest Service in the Northeastern area. Good, long friend of mine for many, many years. Um, Kendra McMillan is our uh, intern. She's been working with these communities. She worked with um, Jerry and the, and the Urban Forester and came up with a plan. We wanted to put together a model program and Westchester is implementing their plan. So, Opain, Lou, is a forest entomologist that was actually working in Michigan State University and the U.S. Forest Service in Michigan when the Emerald Ash Borer hit. So I kind of stole him from Michigan, and he's now my forest entomologist, which is great. And he took together all this other stuff, and we put together some template management options, which is available on our website. And we are now working with a number of these communities. Early on, Allegheny County Parks, I mentioned that. Um, we also got some funding for them and Pittsburgh um, to treat emerald ash borer. The ones with the stars have plans that are available online. Uh, we're working with State College, Lancaster, Lewisburg. Um, unfortunately, the, by the time they got there, they were pretty hit pretty hard, but they did a nice ash utilization of some of their big trees that they had in their park. Easton's will be done in May. Tioga County is a little bit different situation. We've got the borough of Wellsboro, but there was some other townships up there that um, we didn't want to have to do a plan for each township. So if any of you are familiar with the cooperative weed management areas, we took that concept and applied it to Emerald Ash Borer for Tioga County. So we're working with the Tioga County Conservation District. Mm -hmm. And um, we took these two communities because these were the only two that wanted to move forward, but it's now available to anybody else who wants to join. And um, worked with the community, some local universities, some interns, et cetera, and got an ASH uh, assessment done. And we do the same thing in Williamsport. These um, three cities, Grove City, Reading, and Pottsville that we worked with, um, didn't have a tree inventory done. So the first thing we did with them is, anybody here at I Tree Street? free online to do um, inventory work, et cetera, and you can enter your stuff in and gives you eco services analysis and all that kind of stuff. But we put on some iTree workshops with those three universities, and then they went out, those students, and did the tree inventories in those communities, and now they're working with Kendra, like they, they did with the other communities, and doing an ash assessment and coming up with their um, uh, emerald ash borer management plan. Um, we did do some work with Altoona, like I said, they said we're just going to do our 90, 94 trees. We did work, did some work with Pottstown, but they didn't want to join in, so they're kind of doing their own thing. So um, this was from a federal grant from the Forest Service, it actually was a competitive grant. Um, it'll expire sometime next year when we produce our, our report. Um, the template is, can be completely, you know, as detailed as you want, but it's laying out your authorities and things like that. Um, the big thing is, is developing your cost-benefit analysis, which we did in um, um, we did in uh, uh, Westchester, and once it got completed, it went before the borough council, and they actually appropriated some money to implement it. And then we also um, uh, applied for some Forest Service funding, just twenty-five thousand dollars, and they've treated about a hundred uh, ash trees um, over a three-year period, and we've got that implemented. And that's very similar to what um, everybody else is doing. There's basically four management options. You can do nothing. Um, you're just going to wait till all your trees die, except for that's going to be a huge expense because if you're responsible for that tree, you got to take them down. And it's costly to take down, especially big trees. And remember I told you about the arborists getting injured? They're really going to jack the price up on you if you've got a, a dead ash tree. So um, it, you might think that, okay, I've got no... Uh, no no funding for treatments, et cetera, but it's actually probably the highest cost alternative is to do nothing. If you've got a lot of ash trees, do an ash assessment, see if you've got ash trees and see whether or not you need a plan or not. But if you've got ash trees and you do this, that's actually the highest cost option. Selective management, most communities do this or a mixture of this. They do an assessment and they find out where their high value ash trees are. You know, you, you get a street tree that the city is responsible for, but it's under a power line. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything with that one. I'm not gonna put another tree there. I'm not gonna protect that one. It's under the power line. 
It's already 50% in decline. Heck, I'm going to put that on the list to cut down. And that's actually what Borough Westchester did. They had 18 street trees, decided we're going to take them all down. And they just spread the cost out over, and we'll take three trees down this year, three trees down this year, three trees down this year. Or if they decline a little bit quicker. So your high value ash trees, you monitor those and you determine which ones that you might want to use chemical control uh, with. And then um, places like uh, Westchester, they have tree ordinances, the Tree City USA, every time a tree comes down, they plant two. So um, that's something too to work with uh, shade tree commissions and things like that. Um, the annual cost spread is spread out. We asked people probably to look into a 10 year plan because of this thing about what happens in the aftermath forest after emerald ash borer comes through. You know, do we need to keep treating every third year or every fourth year? Maybe we can skip a year. Uh, preemptive is sort of like uh, you're going to play emerald ash borer and I'm going to take down all my ash trees now. Okay, or I'm going to spread it out. Some communities, in, like Milwaukee, started, okay, well we're going to treat a number of our trees to give us time, because they'll keep those alive. We'll take down these trees. These are treated so they're not going to die. And then we, it gives them time, by time, to take down the trees in a more orderly fashion. Actually, after they did that and they treated all those trees, they said, hey, that wasn't so bad. That wasn't so costly. Let's just keep the trees. So that's when Milwaukee, they, they switched from a preemptive thing with some treatments to Selective management, no, we're, we're going to keep them. So, in any case, um, preemptive, uh, uh, you're basically letting all your, your public trees, they're going to go. You're going to have to remove them, especially if they're going to become hazard trees. Uh, you don't need any surveys. Your initial cost is high due to the removals, or if you can at least spread them out over time. Um, if um, you've got some wooded areas, uh, for instance, in Westchester, the Gordon Preserve, anybody familiar with that at the Westchester University? Um, they've got a bunch of ash there. When it gets there, we're going to look at that as a biocontrol site. So this is kind of summarizes the action alternatives and looking at the, the, the three um, uh, management things and, and your average cost and whether or not you're actually protecting any ash trees. This is available online. Um, it looks nasty, but it actually makes a lot of sense. This is your ash tree assessment. You start out looking, is it alive or dead? Where is it located? You make decisions. We don't recommend treating anything under four inches. It's easy to take down. Just, if you want to keep it, you don't need um, triage. You can use a, a, a medical or something like that. But we actually recommend it. It's small, it's easy to take it down now. Um, and then you look at the health of the tree. Anything that is fair or poor, don't bother. You're not going to be able to get that insecticide up into that tree. So, um, state forest lands. We've got a lot of uh, ash in our state forest. We're not going to go treat all of them. The problem with ash is when it dies and goes away, there's no seed bank after a very short period of time. So once it's removed from the environment, there's no ash. So we're collecting seed. We are going to treat somewhere around 3,000 or so ash trees of various species to keep them alive in the woods so that they can continue to produce seed and we still have that genetic resource available to us. The other thing that we want to do is monitor as that wave comes through the 1%, especially in white ash. They have found, we call it lingering ash. They say, back in Michigan, they say, well, that tree's dead, that tree's dead, that tree's alive, and that tree's dead, that tree's dead. What, it just missed that one? I don't think so. And there actually is a chemical difference. And you think about a bell curve, what did you just do? A high selection pressure, you're selecting for the tail. So there is some work being done on that. So we, our goal is to conserve, um, we've got some uh, seed orchards in Pennsylvania, in our, our pen nursery, and we're, tr we're, we're going to protect those and we're doing a lot of training, and this is what there is, that 1%. Folks in Ohio State, Michigan State, and some other folks are, are looking for that. We will be looking for those um, as well. We do a lot of seed collections, and this is that quest for resistance. I'm not gonna go through this, but there's different levels of that. Um, 
Also hybridization, maybe with some of the Asian species, that's kind of down. We really want to look at this lingering ash thing right now. Um, go ahead. So that was my question, yeah. like Penn State doing yeah. the So there's different people looking at this. So that's the goal. The long-term goal for ash is going to be the genetic resistance to tolerance and biological control. We use chemical control to keep things alive long enough to see if we can come up with a solution. What uh, makes Fraxinus so susceptible, and are there still any ashes left in China? Um, in China, the ash trees are resistant. Emerald ash borer is a minor secondary pest. Um, as soon as it attacks the tree, and you can actually see this in some of the North American ones, the tree tries to form a canker around it, and it basically walls it off. Plus, it has its biocontrol agents. So between the biocontrol agents and the quick response of those ash trees, um, to that an initial attack by walling it off. So then it, it forms a canker. So remember that S-shaped gallery? It, it, that S-shaped gallery gets bigger as it goes down. Well, the tree <coughs> chemically is a chemical defense. It walls it off, forms a canker, and, and then kills it. Um, North American ash planted in China attacked and killed. Cost per tree for the chemical treatment? It depends on the diameter of the tree. And I actually got a spreadsheet online that will calculate that for you. You go to a, I have a nice big, you go, say I've got uh, six trees that are 10 inches in diameter, you plug in the number, it'll calculate the cost of the treatment for you. Okay. In summary, this is not just another forest insect pest. It's going to kill nearly all healthy ash trees. Your tree is going to die within three to five years. It's going to be massive ash mortality. I've seen this. It's not if, it's not maybe, it's going to happen. The hazard tree situation is critical. You need a plan. Tree early before you can detect it, especially down in this part of, of, of the state. And we are available to meet with you and talk with you.